Rocky White, um, uh, Director of Fletcher Maritime Studies Program at uh, Tufts University. My question is, I'll keep it brief, is what is your definition of victory in Ukraine? Thank you. Okay, here we go. To start with a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> let me start by saying, and I will answer the question, but it needs a bit of explaining. Because uh, we live in a world where a lot of people think that everything is plannable, controllable, zero risk. That's the societies we have built by now. And unfortunately, in a war, that's not how it works. Because war is playing chess between two nations with armed forces that are able to destruct, to kill, to damage. So it is, it is not nice. It is not nice at all. And both sides will look for opportunities to become more successful than they are now. And if you look back over the last thousand days almost, 969 days the war is raging, um, we saw the invasion. Uh, basically, the Russians have made extremely big strategic mistakes. I think. Mr. Putin has not achieved any of his strategic goals, which were basically a regime change in Ukraine. Um, then, fairly quickly, uh, and they took quite a big part of a chunk of, of Ukraine, the Russians, and then basically, fairly quickly, the, Ru the, the Ukrainians took back about 50% of what the Russians originally had taken, and then we came into this next phase where both sides uh, were learning and uh, in a way became better. And you have to become better because you lose people, soldiers every day, apart from stuff, you know, you know, weapon systems and ammunition, but you lose a lot of people. It's one of the topics where a lot of nations need to think about because whether you have professional armed forces or not, you will have to think about if if you are in a conflict, after a couple of days, those professional soldiers get wounded and die. And then you have to find new soldiers. So every country has to think about this, as we basically have seen in this war. Now, both sides at the moment are looking at the same type of problems. They both look for new soldiers, they both look for new capabilities, and they both look for new ammunition. And then they will look for opportunities with those new troops and the new capabilities to either gain more territory, the Russians, or to retake territory, the Ukrainians. Now, the Ukrainians did the counteroffensive in the summer of 2023. And because we are in this sort of mindset of everything is planable, so we thought, OK, we have given them the weapons, we have given them the training, we've given them the ammunition, so now they're going to win. But we forgot about the fact that the Russians were building these defensive works. And then every time we were talking about a type of weapon systems that would help the Ukrainians, we thought about it a little bit long because of this red line discussion. And then basically the time we took to decide to give it and to allow the Ukrainians to use it, the Russians strengthened the defensive works. So by the time the counteroffensive started, uh, the Ukrainians had a very tough job. They had to penetrate minefields between 10 and 15 kilometers deep, five to six mines per square meter. And so war is not planable as a lot of us think. And therefore, we are now in a situation where uh, there, is, there is some movement at the front, the Russians are taking uh, slowly, relatively little bits of land per day, but they take a little bit of land per day, against enormous costs when it comes to human lives. We're talking more than 350,000 Russian soldiers wounded and killed. 350,000. I don't think it's all Icelandic people here, but if in your nations there would be a hundred 
a week, you would have a, a fair, a difficult discussion in your parliaments and in your population. The Russians suffer about a thousand a day. So it is unimaginable for most of us what is happening at the front. People think war is about cyber, hypersonics, AI, sort of a clean war. That was what people predicted a couple of years ago. A war of bits and bots, but it is also still a war of mud and blood, which is about gaining territory, defending territory, gaining territory. Using tactics of World War I, trench warfare, artillery barrages, wave after wave of infantry soldiers. So it is a dirty war and it is difficult. I think you can say that by now the Russians count on quantity and the Ukrainians on quality. It is amazing what the Ukrainians have achieved against this mighty Russian armed forces. Um, yes, with our help, but the courage of the Ukrainian people is amazing. After a while, people that played in the symphony orchestra and the ballerinas from the National <clears throat> Ballet were in the trenches in Ukraine. That is what war does to a nation. And if you ask people in, in Iceland now, would you like to go to war? I would be surprised if, if all the young people would say yes. Of course you don't, if you live in a prosperous country where there is freedom, <clears throat> where there is prosperity. And yes, there are problems, but if you compare things in the, in the world, I think Iceland has limited problems. And, this, and the same for a lot of NATO allies. And then, um, but if a war starts, uh, then things change, because it is about your country losing your country and then suddenly a lot of people don't want that to happen so if people now say you know ukraine has to basically give away what they have lost and then make peace and then we can carry on with our lives without this war in europe you know if you would say that try to imagine if people would say that to you when it was about iceland or about your nation and I think then you would give a different answer. So war is difficult and therefore it is extremely difficult to give an answer, a precise answer to your question, what is the definition of victory? Because it depends on who you talk to. It might be so, although he has achieved none of his strategic objectives, that Putin in the end can claim that whatever he has taken is a success. Even if he would like to have the whole of Ukraine but he still doesn't have the whole of Donbass or the whole of, Lu uh, of the Luhansk region. So he's still struggling to get the sort of minimum option. But the only language that Putin understands is strength and power. So the Ukrainians say to me that if we would agree to a settlement now, it doesn't mean that we will not have war in a month or a year time again. So it has to be connected to security agreements and a security arrangement for Ukraine. 